What's going on everybody? So in today's video, I'm going to be giving a book review of Robert Ringer's Winning Through Intimidation. Now I know the title may sound a little uh, offensive or maybe a little off-putting, but it's actually a great book and it's not necessarily about how to go around intimidating everybody. The book is really about how not to be intimidated, how to maybe increase your posture, power, things like that. And it's written by a former commercial real estate agent. And what I like about the book is it's written in basically like theories and stories. It's a pretty easy read. And he just goes through different real estate deals that he, he did. And this was actually written in the 70s. So it's an older book, but it still applies today. And he just talks about different deals and how different people may have tried to, uh, you know, get their commission from him or how different sellers did this, different buyers did this. It has a lot of practical real world experience that you can take no matter what uh, business you're in. And if you don't want to read the book, lucky for you, I'm making this video right now. So um, I'm going to tell you 10 things I learned. It's really just 10 theories from his book that you can apply uh, you know today. So theory number one, uh, he has something called the makeable deal theory, and in that he basically talks about you know some real estate agents, some real estate brokers, real estate investors, other people. They might be trying to go for like that pie in the sky type of deal. You know that deal where yeah it could happen, but it, it it's probably not going to happen. And you should focus more of your time on you know the motivated sellers, motivated buyers, people that are serious. Um, and not necessarily trying to go for like the $10 million deal. I remember I was talking with uh, someone that was kind of new to real estate and he was asking me about this one deal and he wanted to like develop townhomes in some community and it was, it sounded like a big project. He's like, yeah, if I just build like 60 townhouses and then, you know, refinance them and then do this and do that. And I was just like, what are you talking about? You know, the chance, the likelihood of a deal like that going through are so slim. And why would you ever want to do that for one of your first deals? Like you've got to get a couple deals under your belt first, <laughs> you know, before you try to do something like that. So basically focus on maybe more of like the smaller deals that have a higher likelihood of going through. And, you know, I, I'm not saying don't go after the bigger deals, but to just keep it in perspective. Okay. The next theory that he had was the fiddle theory. And this was uh, basically if you fiddle around with the deal too much, the likelihood of it actually closing or, you know, it's going to get smaller and smaller. And so he basically says time kills all deals. So the longer a deal drags out, the less likelihood it's going to close. And I found that to be exactly true from working as a real estate agent and investor. You know, the longer a deal goes, uh, scenarios change, lenders change, uh, motivations change. There's other people that get involved. So it can turn into a huge mess. <laughs> um, I actually have a couple of deals right now like that where, you know, it's, they've been going on for, you know, six months and it's just like every... Every week, you know, something new happens and you're just like, oh my gosh, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta try to get people, you know, to closing as soon as possible. Okay. So the next theory he had was the organic chemistry theory. And this he actually referenced to uh, when he took organic chemistry in, you know, ninth grade or 10th grade or, you know, whenever you take organic chemistry, clearly I either did not take it or probably failed. But anyways, he talked about there, there's always like the one kid in the class that wants to basically tell everyone how to do organic chemistry. So he'll be giving tips, you know, answering all the questions, holding court, oh, almost like bragging. So he described it as like the, the person that's bragging, like the bragger, um, oftentimes knows the least or, you know, it doesn't necessarily make them the smartest person. Basically, what someone else knows or, or thinks they know about real estate or organic chemistry is not going to really affect you in any way or it shouldn't. You know, you should almost pay them no mind. And I actually know a specific example I can relate this to in real estate. I, I know one uh, real estate agent and he completely trashed his real estate investing. He has all these theories about why it doesn't work, this and that. And he'll, he could probably talk for hours. But the only problem is he's never actually done a successful real estate investment deal. I think he's pretty much lost money on the two deals that he did. And so he's basing these, he's coming up with like theories based on like one or two reference experiences and yet, like I said, this guy will talk to you, you know, talk your ear off about how it doesn't work. But again, you know, if you, and if you were to listen to that person, you probably would stop real estate investing or, you, you know, you wouldn't see it in the same light. And I always say, you know, people like that, people that just have a really negative opinion on something, you know, they should come with like full disclosure. Like, okay, how many deals have you actually successfully done? Oh, zero. Okay. <laughs> you know, you shouldn't listen to people like that. All right. The next theory he had was the mortality theory. So he basically said that, you know, your career or your life, you know, it's obviously it's not going to last forever. So you should uh, aim high and move fast. So basically you're saying go for everything you can, you know, go for the top. You know, there's no reason to just play it safe. Uh, playing it safe is a terrible idea. You know, you hear celebrities and other people talking about that, but there's no reason to. Uh, you might, you're not going to be here forever. You know, 10 years can fly by just like that. So instead of crawling through the ranks, you know, just just go for everything and, and see what happens. And to add on to that theory, because um, you know, if you just try to go for everything and have these huge ambitious goals, 
that could probably stress you out a little bit because <laughs> your, your expectations are probably pretty high. So he has this other theory called the ice ball theory. He has these weird names for his theories. But basically, the ice ball theory states that, uh, you know, in 50 billion years, you know, the sun is going to burn out and Earth is just going to be one huge frozen ice ball. And so while you should try to get everything you can and just go for it, go for it all, you shouldn't be stressed out. You shouldn't be completely stressing over, over it because in the future, you know, nothing's really going to matter. Everything's going to be gone. It's just going to be, I guess the Earth is going to be some uh, massive ice ball is what he's saying. So try to go for it all, but at the same time, don't like completely stress out and like lose sleep every night uh, over your goals and ambitions. Okay, so the next theory is the theory of intimidation. And he talks about uh, someone's results are inversely proportionate to the amount that they are intimidated. So basically what he's saying there is that uh, the deals that he was intimidated the most, he had the worst result and, and got, you know, essentially beat up uh, financially. So, you know, the less you're intimidated, the more savvy, the more comfortable you're going to be. The next theory actually explains about how to have a better posture, image, things like that. So as far as his posture and power and, and wanted to be more of like, I guess, an intimidating factor, um, he was he wanted to stand out. So he wanted to do things differently than other brokers. And so since he was a commercial real estate agent, he was doing deals uh, basically across the country. And what he would do when he was meeting with a seller, whether to list a property or maybe a buyer uh, or wherever it may be, he would actually fly on private jets. He would bring uh, assistants and secretaries with him. A lot of times he'd bring his lawyer, uh, he would have like fancy brochures and pamphlets and things like that. This was the 70s, so that was like a big deal back then. Uh, but he really took into consideration his posture and his image. So instead of just being another real estate broker, he was like the the high flying, uh, mysterious, you know, not international, but he would always be coming from a different city and bringing lawyers with him, like this whole team with him. So, you know, people knew he wasn't really messing around. Maybe you don't need to go that extreme, obviously. You know, private jets are not the cheapest thing in the world. But there's probably some small things that you could do. And I don't think you need to go crazy with it. But for example, you know, if you're a real estate agent, maybe instead of wearing a polo shirt with like a little name tag on it, maybe instead you try to look a little bit more professional, like wear a suit. I mean, God forbid you actually wear a suit and, and dress up and look uh, professional. Uh, or maybe uh, instead of having like a Gmail email address, you spend what $10 and, and actually get a, a real like website, a real domain uh, email address and look like you're an actual business. Look a little bit more professional. And lastly, uh, you know, you could lease a nicer car. You know, nobody wants their real estate agent to show up in some beater car. I I've seen it happen, but why would you ever want that? If you're a client and you're making the biggest financial decision of your life, you know, you don't want someone showing up with like a name tag and, and you know, in a beater car with like some hotmail email address. And you can actually lease like a nice car. I'm not saying you need to get, you know, a Rolls Royce Phantom or anything like that. But you can lease, you know, a nice BMW for like three or four hundred bucks a month. You could write it off, um, you know, and that, that's only if you have like, you know, a really bad car. Uh, but, you know, just little things like that can really add up. All right. The next theory he talked about was having a positive mental attitude. And that's, uh, you know, obviously everyone needs a positive mental attitude. But he said a positive mental attitude is basically going to be in direct proportion to how prepared you are. So the more, you know, let's say you study the comps, you study the neighborhood, Maybe even study the client, you know, you do a little background research, Google them, look them up on Facebook or LinkedIn or Instagram. Um, you know, you can probably find out a lot of information to help you be better prepared. So overall, being prepared is just going to make you more comfortable, make you a better negotiator. And he also said, look, every deal is not going to close. It's not always going to be your fault. So always keep in mind that there's another deal coming around. So make sure you prepare as much as possible. Like if I'm doing a showing or something like that, I try to read all the articles about the neighborhood. I might get there early, you know, talk to the neighbors, things like that. But again, not every deal is going to close. You shouldn't like just be hanging on every last deal. Um, you know, expect the best, but assume the worst. His next theory is called the Uncle George theory. So I guess he had an uncle named George who worked in a convenience store. And this guy worked... Uh, very long hours. I think he worked like 14 hours a day, like seven days a week. And the theory was that uh, long hours and quote unquote hard work is a very relative term. So that's going to mean completely different things to different people. And it's not going to guarantee you of success. So this guy who owned the little corner store, he worked like every single day, but he, he basically just got old and didn't really make that much money. So he was saying sometimes it makes sense to like recharge, strategize, maybe outsource some things, think of how you can leverage yourself, maybe so you don't have to work that long. Because at a certain point, you know, if you're working like 15 or 20 hours a day, people say they work 20 hours a day, but I don't think they, you know, are, are they really doing that? Uh, you, you need to recharge. There's going to be like a law of diminishing returns. So after a while, if you're working like 20 hours a day, but you're only working at like 50% capacity, 
there's probably going to be people that only work like five or six hours a day, but they're fully recharged. They're focused. They're not looking at their text messages and Instagram messages and emails, you know, every, every single like five minutes and being distracted, you know, they're, they're focused. Okay. And his last theory and probably his most famous theory is called the leapfrog theory. So that basically says, uh, there's no requirement that you need to work your way up through the ranks. You can just leapfrog the competition and pretty much declare yourself uh, at the top. Now with this one, you always, you know, you have to back it up as well. So if you don't have the chops to back it up, you could get into some issues, but basically you don't need to wait for anyone to anoint you the, the expert of whatever it is. You can just declare yourself the expert. And he actually gave one story about a doctor who wanted to become like the celebrity doctor. And I think he was working in some small town and he really wanted to become the celebrity doctor. So he said, you know what, I'm going to move to LA. I'm going to become the celebrity doctor. And it's pretty much what he did. Um, so you don't need to work your way through the ranks. You can just leapfrog through everybody. Um, and you know, you got to think big. So like his uh, ice ball theory and his mortality theory, you're only here for a little bit, so you might as well, you know, shoot for the stars and, and see what happens. All right, so that is my review or more of like a summary of uh, Robert Ringer's Winning Through Intimidation. And the guy, he's got a lot of great insights. And this is from like real world experience too, so that's why I like a lot of his books. And he's got a whole series of books that I think pretty much have all been New York Times bestsellers. He's got a very distinctive way of writing. It's very easy to read because it's just stories. And that's a tip for you as a writer. If you're ever writing anything, just write in stories. That's how people can relate. It's such an easy way to learn. So thanks for watching this video. Uh, please subscribe. Please share it, like it, whatever you got to do. And I will see you in the next one. All right, bye.